This morning, it's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce my friend Betsy. Elizabeth Betsy Watry is a researcher, author, speaker, and independent scholar specializing in 19th and early 20th century cultural history of the American West. Her primary research interests are in tourism and women's history. She holds a master's in history from Montana State University and is co-author of Images of America, Yellowstone National Park, Images of America, Livingston, Montana, and Ho for Wonderland, Traveler's Accounts of Yellowstone, 1872 to 1914. Her newest books in 2012 are Images of America for Yellowstone, Women in Wonderland, Lives, Legends, and Legacies of Yellowstone National Park, which we'll speak about today. In addition to being an accomplished historian and author, Betsy is a museum professional who has worked in a variety of institutions, including the Heritage and Research Center in Yellowstone National Park, Charlie Russell Museum in Great Falls, Montana, Museum of Northern Arizona, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, and here, Buffalo Bill Historical Center. She is currently a curatorial assistant with the History Department at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. And just on a personal note, uh, I do want to point out, and I think this probably resulted partly from your research on women in Yellowstone, but uh, Betsy is a tremendous driver through winter storms. <laughs> when is that? Uh, three or four years ago, we formed a caravan of historians trying to flee Denver in the middle of a snowstorm to get back home when we were attending the Western History Association conference there. So she definitely knows how to get around Wyoming, the West, in winter. So please join me in welcoming Betsy Watry. Thank you very much. I am uh, overwhelmed by the crowd, to be honest with you. This is terrific. Um, one of the things that I'm always asked about um, when I'm uh, doing these presentations is um, where my inspiration came from. Yellowstone, of course, is the first inspiration. My parents brought me here when I was eight years old. Uh, I fell in love with the park, decided one day I was going to come and live here. Um, when I was a kid, I also used to like to read biographies of women, so Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor, um, Jane Goodall, um, Amelia Earhart, a uh, woman pilot, and of course, histories of the West, which included sensational characters such as Calamity Jane um, and Annie Oakley. And I wanted to be, when I was growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut or a marine biologist or national park ranger. Uh, something totally non-traditional. So I always sought out stories of women in non-traditional women occupations, sorry. Um, and they kind of served as my role models. Um, I finally moved west in 2001 and essentially recreated my life. <laughs> oh, sorry, wrong button. Um, Went back to school, decided to get my master's degree in history, and that's where I discovered the history of the women in the West was really huge. So I thought, well, I'll just take a slice of women's history and I'll just do the women of Yellowstone. Well, I found out that was equally as huge. <laughs> my initial idea was to take these slices of life of women in Yellowstone, maybe 10 pages a piece, and then you know, just do something really simple, 150 pages or something like that. But what I found were these women's lives were so rich, their early lives, their education, their later life experiences. So these women that I've profiled in this book ended up being full-blown biographies. So in the book, I've profiled 14 women in 12 chapters. We're not going to have time to do all of them. So I'm just going to give you some glimpses and, and snippets of um, a few women. The first being Anna K. Trishman Pryor and Elizabeth Bell Trishman. Um, and through the more than 50 years in Yellowstone, Anna and Elizabeth endured a number of trials, tribulations, and family tragedies. The first of which happened while they were just children. In the spring of 1899, 
Anna Elizabeth's father, George W. Trishman, moved, he was a wheelwright, got a job in Yellowstone National Park and moved the family there. Their mother, Margaret Gleason Trishman, had had um, a previous history of mental instability, had been treated apparently unsuccessfully. Um, in June, she took the life of her youngest son, Joseph, with a butcher knife. She was tried and convicted of murder even though she was declared insane. Um, but one of the things I discovered in my research is that from this newspaper clipping and several others, it was always believed that the Trishman family only had four children. And so for the past 30 years, that the historians have been insane. There were actually five. Um, Anna and Elizabeth were the, the, what, the um, I'm sorry, Harry and Elizabeth were fraternal twins. Uh, George turned out to be the missing link. He ended up um, going off to Gonzaga University and becoming a merchant seaman. So he never spent any time in Yellowstone. Um, thank goodness for census records online and various other uh, research tools. We've been able to piece his life together a little bit more. So despite the fact that they had you know, these, this trauma early in their life, all of the children ended up becoming very, um, uh, having very rich and um, rewarding lives. Harry ended up being a career National Park Ranger, and, Anna and, and George ended up becoming a merchant seaman in Alaska, and Anna and Elizabeth became very successful businesswomen in Yellowstone. Anna and Elizabeth um, got their start in Yellowstone in 1912 as partners. Previous to that, Anna and her husband George had purchased the specimen house from Ole Anderson in 1908. And at that time, they changed the name of the store to the Park Curio store. And I think I should explain what specimens are. It was a real popular thing to do in the 1890s or so to put objects in the travertine waters in Mount Hot Springs, let the water run over them, and it would coat them. So you, they put in bottles and combs and um, toy cannons and horseshoes um, in an effort to prevent hundreds of people from trampling up on the terraces the army who was in charge of the administration of the park in the early 1900s gave Ole Anderson a permit so that he could go up and set up these rocks and then coat these specimens and then sell them. So that's what um, Anna and Elizabeth ended up starting to sell. The other thing they sold were these sand paintings, which were done by a gentleman called, named Andy Wald. And he would actually do demos in the um, stores and these sand paintings still exist. There's some in the museum collection in Yellowstone National Park. One of the other popular things to do in Mammoth was to go down into Devil's Kitchen. It was a subterranean cave that had smelly gases and bats, a nearly vertical ladder. I mean, this ladder still, I mean, it just goes straight down, some of the photos we had from the early days. Um, so La Anna and Elizabeth thought this would be a great place to put up a little refreshment stand for these plucky adventurers who decided to go down there. So in 1924, they opened up the Devil's Kitchenette. And Anna and Elizabeth were not without competition. George Whitaker, um, um, he was a former army scout. Um, he had um, operated the general store in 1913. Um, and he also built the store and gas station at Canyon. In 1932, he decided to retire and Anna and Elizabeth decided to buy his enterprises. The amazing part of this story is that in the middle of a nationwide economic depression, two women were able to get a bank loan to 
buy this business, which they paid off uh, a couple years later. So with the acquisition of George Whitaker's stores, Elizabeth and Anna had full control of the north end of the park. So they had a curio store, a coffee shop, general store, a gas station at Mammoth. Um, then at the campground, they had a cafeteria, a general store, the Devil's Kitchenette, um, and a canyon, a general store, and a gas station. Um, in addition to expanding their operation, they also expanded the stores. This is the original store, and it actually is tripled in size. The original store is kind of like the middle third in this photo. So after weathering several more family tragedies, two world wars, a devastating economic depression, and serving visitors for over 40 years, Anne and Elizabeth decided to retire. Um, and they sold out to the Hamilton stores, which I'll talk about later in the program. Uh, this is a photo of Anne and Elizabeth when they came back in 1956 uh, for the groundbreaking ceremony for the Canyon Village, uh, which was part of the Mission 66 project. And they look pretty happy to not be working. <laughs> I met Christine Carlson Eagle. After losing both of her parents by the time she had become a teenager, Ida Carlson was looking for an opportunity to leave her home state of Wisconsin and recreate her life. Um, she answered an ad in the newspaper for waitresses at the Fountain Hotel in Yellowstone National Park, was hired, hopped on the Northern Pacific train because at that point in time, um, there were, that was the only railroad coming in. This is 1905 and um, got on a stagecoach. In those days, the employees and the visitors had to get in through the park through the on the stagecoaches. So she arrived and saw Sam Eagle sitting on a rock spying her and said, hmm, I bet he thinks he's smart. Apparently he was pretty smart because they started dating. This is a fabulous photograph that I got from the family of Ida and Sam at Giant Geyser in 1905. Um, and while this may look like their Sunday best, this is the way people traveled around Yellowstone in the early 1900s. One of the most rewarding parts of this book was making connections with the families and descendants. In the family vault in the Eagle Store, we discovered a hundred letters that Sam and Ida had, well, Sam had written to Ida. Uh, Sam was kind of a transient <laughs> that winter and just didn't keep all of his letters. But he wrote these letters to Ida between 1905 and 1907. And there were over a hundred of them, which I digitized for the family, and they now have records of them. But they learned about a grandmother they never knew because it was before um, they were married and before they were children. So I am on a bandwagon to revive the art of letter writing so that your family history can be full. I then Sam married in September 1907, just as the Union Pacific Railroad was making its way to West Yellowstone. They put in, they saw it as an opportunity to start their own business, put in for a permit with the Forest Service, which was granted. Spent that winter in California, um, putting together their plans for the store. Came in on the first train in 1908 and set up their first store. Um, they, they also were partners with the Stewart family who ended up breaking off and starting their own store. They also had the um, gas station and service station as well. They also added in 1910 a soda fountain, which I think is one of the earliest soda fountains in the West, and they made their own ice cream as well. And in those days, the store was not just a store, it was the post office, it was the social place where everybody gathered, and it was also the place where the early telephone operators uh, worked out of, and Ida Eagle was one of the first telephone operators, and then her kids would get on bicycles and run off and tell people they had a phone call. 
And of course, with soda fountains comes Ida Eagle's chocolate sauce. The family does not know exactly when she started this, but it became one of those family best kept secrets. It is still a secret. There are about three people in the family that know the recipe, and they're the only ones that are allowed to make it behind closed doors and then bring it back out. And they actually sell this in the store now in bottles. So as tourism to the park increased, their store also expanded uh, several times. Um, this is the store in 1942, um, and they've also added a gas station. This is a great picture of the interior. And the store, because it was the only supply depot pretty much between here, or between there and Bozeman, um, they had to carry everything from clothing to groceries to uh, fishing equipment. And in addition to expanding the store, Ida expanded the family. They had 10 children in all. Henry was the first born in 1908, and Wally is the last born in 1927. This is a picture of them in Yellowstone on one of their famous family Sunday afternoon picnics. They always made sure they took time out for the family. Ida had a multitude of children playing around her one day. And this stranger walked up and said, hello, madam. Are these all your children, or is this a picnic? She said, they're all mine, and mister, it is no picnic. <laughs> One of the few quotes we have from Ida. <laughs> and in addition to feeding all of her 10 children, Ida had to feed all of the multitudes of seasonal employees that they had that came in. This was a very busy store, and um, they would hire a lot of college students to come in. Um, and so Ida had an expanded family during the summer. Education was very important to the Eagle family. So each year for two decades, Ida and the kids would get all packed up in the car with all the luggage and go to Bozeman. So Sam and Ida basically for several decades um, lived separate lives during the beginning and end of, of school year. Um, and then in the summertime, all the kids came back and worked in the stores. And Wally, I interviewed Wally and he remembers telling me as soon as he could hold a feather duster, he was dusting. <laughs> and I wanted to ask him after he had told me that story if that's where he got his inspiration for his famous fly, which is called Wally's Feather Duster Fly, which apparently is still really popular with the Madison River uh, fly fishermen. All nine children of the Eagle family graduated from Montana State College, which is Montana State University today. Uh, Bill, um, unfortunately, got an infection while he was at school and died. Otherwise, they would have had all 10 children. So Ida was a major contributor also to the way, um, West Yellowstone community. She helped establish schools, churches. She and Sam were instrumental in getting the first airport um, laid out and uh, started in West Yellowstone in the late 1930s. So they also you know, basically survived two world wars, um, economic depression, and a 1959 7.5 earthquake that rocked the town of West Yellowstone. And don't forget that famous chocolate sauce, too. In 19, or, I'm sorry, 2008, the Eagle Store celebrated the 100th anniversary. Four of the original children were at that celebration, Rose, Betty, Joe, and Wally. We have since lost Rose and Betty, but Wally and Joe are still with us, which is a great resource. Marguerite Peg Lindsley Arnold. She is truly a, a child of the park. She was the daughter of Chester Lindsley. He was the first assistant superintendent in the park to Horace Albright uh, from 1916 to 1922. He was also the postmaster from 1922 to 35 um, under four different presidential um, 
appointments, um, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, and Roosevelt. Oops, sorry. She was literally born in the park, lived in the park, worked in the park, and died in the park. Um, and she practically grew up on a horse. She said she liked hiking, skiing, fishing, and she always said it was a mistake she wasn't born a boy. She was actually the third woman ranger hired in Yellowstone. Um, there prior to her was Liz, uh, Isabel Bassett Wasson. She was hired in 1920. And then Mary Rolfe actually signed her papers three days before Marguerite, so she became the second one. However, Marguerite ended up becoming the very first permanent woman ranger in Yellowstone. And she was responsible for guiding thousands of visitors around the Mammoth Hot Springs. And since she grew up there, she probably knew more than anybody. <laughs> so it was probably quite the tour. She went off to college. Um, she also attended Montana State College and graduated um, and then decided that she was wanted to be a doctor or do something along the medical line. Ended up at the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in bacteriology. She graduated in 1924, decided she wanted to come back to Yellowstone. And at that time, all she had for transportation was her Harley Davidson. So she and her girlfriend, Claire LaValle, hopped on the motorcycle in 1924, two women, and drove 2,600 miles in 17 days, which I find just incredible. I do my cross-country trips all the time, but at least I know where the gas stations are. <laughs> now I'm not even sure they knew that. She was featured in an August issue of Harley Davidson Enthusiast magazine, and I love this quote, quote, poo. What's a little trip from Philadelphia to Yellowstone? Lots of men make longer trips all the time. Nobody thinks anything about it, but just because we're girls, they think we've done something wonderful. In addition to doing tours for the Park Service, she also did private tours um, for some of the various um, outfitters. This was a Howard Eaton tour. He was a horse outfitter out of um, Wyoming and he would do these multi-day trips into Yellowstone and hire Marguerite as a guide. She was guiding a group around the artist's paint pots and stepped on a fragile piece of crust, fell in, and burned her leg, which earned her the name Paint Pot Peg. Around 1927, she met Ben Arnold. He was a fresh ranger recruit. And in 1928, they were married. And shortly thereafter, in 1932, their son Bill was born. Marguerite had a lot of different talents, and one of them that sh she was an artist. And so when she was um, raising Bill early on, it gave her an opportunity to do a lot of artwork. So she created her own Christmas cards, such as this one. Um, she did note cards that they sold in the park. She and another lady um, would collect seeds between Livingston and Gardner and um, sell packets of seeds, which they illustrated as well. And in her later life, she continued her uh, backcountry adventures. She and Ben um, are pretty much being credited with discovering a thermal basin in the Mirror Plateau. Uh, unfortunately, that report has been lost in the archives sort of, um, but Bill has um, a copy of it, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get and do some research on that, but pretty adventurous to go out for multi-day trips in the 1930s on horseback. One of her other talents was that she was also a writer. She contributed over 50 articles to the Nature Notes, which was a magazine that was pretty much originally put out for park personnel so they'd know um, different things about the park, um, but it became so popular that they ended up producing it and sending it out to people on a subscription basis. Some of the topics she covered were um, the foraging habits of the mule deer in winter, um, surveys of hot springs and mammoth, and uh, even poetry. She had a fabulous poem uh, to a wild rose. 
This is an article that she wrote for a national magazine, which was called Nature Magazine, in 1937. Prior to this time, the wolves had been pretty much thought to be eradicated from Yellowstone. So her and Ben's sighting of these wolves made pretty big news. Um, most people were kind of worried about saying anything about seeing wolves because they were pretty much poo-pooed, but there were two of them, so they kind of had some corroboration there. And ironically, Marguerite, who was probably the most lively woman in Yellowstone, ended up with health problems and died at 52. Almost all the other women in the book lived to be in their 90s. Um, some of them are still living that are in their 90s. Um, but she proved to be a major contributor to the development of the National Park Service interpretive programs, and she's added significantly to the um, body of knowledge about Yellowstone. And this is a favorite photograph of her son, Bill, who is still with us as well. He keeps this in his wallet, which is why this is so crinkly. But he asked that I use this because it was one of his favorite pictures of her. Herma Albertson Bagley, A Girl Guide for the Dudes. Herma finished her degree in botany in 1926. She decided Yellowstone was the place that she wanted to practice her craft. So she got a hold of Horace Albright and said, I'd like to be a ranger. And he's like, well, how about if you get a job with the camps company and I'll give you a tryout? So she did that. She was game for that. While she was working as a maid, which they called the pillow punchers, um, and I have a whole um, litany of things about the Yellowstone lingo that they developed from about the 1890s and it ran through about the 1970s. Um, where they came up with their own um, language of, for themselves. But um, they, she also built the nature trail in Old Faithful, which doesn't exist anymore. But it is, if you follow the trail up to the observation point to watch Old Faithful and then go over to Solitary Geyser, that was part of that nature trail. In 1927, she was the only guide on that nature trail. She said that sometimes she had 300 people following her. And can you imagine trying to lecture to 300 people when you're out in the wilderness without any microphones? And one of the other things that were, uh, she did was gather flowers. In the 1920s, they had a museum at Old Faithful, and they actually had live displays of snakes and reptiles and flowers. Um, they no longer do that because picking flowers in the park is illegal. But <laughs> back then, she, and she would actually go hiking 10 or 15 miles away from the major uh, areas to get these flowers as well. And this is Herman, her official uh, ranger uniform. And she became a ranger in uh, 1928. Herma was hiking one day in the summer of 1930, fell, sprained her ankle, and George came and rescued her. <laughs> that kind of sparked a little bit of a romance, probably a big romance because they ended up getting married in 1931. And they continued to both to be rangers uh, for the next couple years. In 1933, Herma is the, the third from the left. Um, in 1933, Herma decided she was going to retire. Her daughter, Ruth Ann, and I have discovered that we, she, we never really knew why she retired. Um, but it turned out that she was pregnant with twins and lost them, and they are buried in the Blackfoot Cemetery. Um, so we were able to put another piece of history together, with, once again, with the descendants. But while she was retired, she and Walter B. McDougall, who was a famous botanist at the time, teamed up and they wrote the first significant book on the plants of Yellowstone, which was published by the Yellowstone Association in 1936. 
Um, she, when the whole time she was doing these tours, people were like, are there any books on the plants? And so she finally got tired of people asking her and wrote one. And uh, Herma also took out time for motherhood later on. So in 1938, she had uh, Ruth Ann, and Ruth Ann was still with us, and once again, she was one of those people I got to go through photo albums and letters and put together a lot of Herma's life. George Bagley continued to work for the Park Service, and he became a very instrumental part of the, develop, the early development of the Park Service policies and procedures. And so he got transferred around a lot. He was in Denver, he was in Washington, he was in Omaha, and he was in Boulder City. Because of this, Herma became exposed to a lot of park housing, mostly deficient park housing. In 1953, she headed up a women's organization. They named themselves the National Park Women's Organization. They did a systematic survey to assess the housing conditions system-wide, nationwide. They found people living in tents, people living in CCC cabins that were meant to be temporary, um, without plumbing, without heat. Uh, Herma's uh, position was that they weren't getting quality applicants to the Park Service because they didn't have adequate housing. So in addition to finding all of these facts out about the deficient housing, she and the women put together proposals of how they could remedy this. So they came up with different house plans that were economical and easy to put up. She and her women's group were able to funnel off money from the Mission 66 project and upgrade all of the park housing nationwide. So a lot of the park housing we have now that everybody's thinking needs replacing um, is part of her project. And this is Herman 1966 after her park housing project had gone through and she looks pretty happy about that. <laughs> Eleanor Ellie Hamilton Pova. Ellie's father was Charles A. Hamilton. He started his business in 1915. In 1920, he married Mae Spence. And in 1921, Ellie was born. And this is the original store in 1917. Um, and this is, this is a view from the side that looks towards the Old Faithful Inn if you've, um, if you've been there. So as Ellie grew up, Ham was expanding his operations. Built the, well he took over another building and, and put in the Lake Store and then he rebuilt his new store in 1919. 19, uh, Basin Auto Camps, Fishing Bridge, West Thumb, Old Faithful Lake Canyon Mammoth Lodge stores, Upper Old Faithful uh, store in 1929 and the Geyser Bass in 1933. Cars had been let in by 19, well, technically 1915, but primarily 1916. And so he had gas stations at all these locations as well. Oh, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Um, actually, I'll let you look at that because it's more interesting. Um, Ellie also had a number of life-threatening events happen to her as she was growing up. She and a little friend, Louise Brothers, who was the daughter of the man who owned the geyser bass initially, decided they were going to go fishing like the grown-ups down at the river. Ellie fell into the hot pool. Little Louise knew she couldn't pull Ellie out, ran up, got her nurse, Nana, who came down and pulled Ellie out of the pool, obviously screaming in pain from being um, boiled, essentially. They took her up to the house. They started peeling off her clothes with her, and her skin started to come off. They rushed her up to the Mammoth Hospital. Dr. Windsor, who was from Livingston, prescribed an oil bath, and she sat in that oil bath for weeks, and she says that's what saved her from being scarred. She has no scars. Ellie is still with us. In fact, I just spent the day with her a couple days ago. And then one other time she was down at Lake visiting her aunt, 
and she's out playing and all of a sudden this bear ambles out of the woods heading straight for her and one of the Yellowstone Park transportation drivers came in between her and the bear and plucked her to safety. She always says, I don't know why I'm still here, but there must be some reason. <laughs> so Ham also, you know, in addition to expanding his operation, continued to make his stores bigger as well. And then expanded his merchandise line. And they carried a lot of uh, Native American goods in, in addition to um, Yellowstone memorabilia type things. And this is a photo of the lake store. This um, knotty pine uh, ornamentation no longer exists. It uh, collapsed about 1945 or so, but it's, it's kind of in keeping with the Old Faithful Inn and, and the other ham store. So in the late 1930s, Ellie caught the eye of Trevor Stewart Poval. He was an oil executive um, from California. They married. Ellie was 19. Her dad was not real happy that she was marrying so early. And she said it took at least five years before her dad realized, OK, maybe this will work. <laughs> After Ham bought the geyser baths in 1933, he tore down the, the small structure and put up this, this large pool. It was fed from the geyser water of the basin. During World War II, a lot of the non-essential operations in the park were shut down, so the pool was shut down. The piping was made out of wood, and so after several years of being shut down, the minerals had just deteriorated the, the plumbing. Ham called Trev and Ellie and said, can you come help me get this back in operation? They said yes and then they never, never left. <laughs> in addition to cleaning up monkey pipes, Ellie did some promotion for the pool. And I just found this photograph two days ago, so I was really excited about it. And, you know, I don't know if her memory is failing, but she, doesn't even, she didn't even know that they used this for a Northern Pacific Railroad ad, uh, which is great. But this is Ellie sitting on the edge of the pool, Old Faithful is behind her, her daughter, first daughter Sandy, and uh, Terry. But I've looked at this ad for 20 years and just never really realized that it was Ellie Pova. Sadly, the pool was declared to be not in fitting with the natural landscape and was dismantled in 1951. By 1948, Ellie and Trev were managing the day-to-day -day operations of the store, but Ham was still in the driver's seat, and so he kept on expanding the stores. Um, they bought the Pryor and Trishman stores in the north section of the park in 1953, so that gave Hamilton's the entire control of the entire park. They also bought the, Hamil uh, the Haynes Picture Shops in 1967, which added 13 more shops. And while they were expanding their operation, they were also expanding their family. Um, Ellie and Trev had four children, and they bought this ranch oh, probably like the late, late 1940s and um, started doing renovations. And Ellie told me that they just kept on adding bedrooms as they had children. So it's kind of an interesting collage of, of rooms. And the Deepwell Ranch is right outside of West Yellowstone. And this is where her kids could ride horses down the Trev Pova Trail. And then that's Lake Ellie behind you, behind there. And today, Ellie continues to expand her legacy by um, a donation that she made to the West Yellowstone community of over $300,000 for this um, community center and senior center in 2004. And then in 2009, she donated over 1,200 cultural objects to the Museum of the Rockies. 
And as uh, Jeremy said, I'm working at the Museum of the Rockies currently, and we're putting together a new exhibit on Yellowstone tourism and concessioners, and a lot of the Pova collection will be shown at that time. In that. And that's going to preview in um, September 2013. So as I said when I began this, this is just some snippets and slices of life of some of these women's lives. These are a few of the other women, and there's a lot more.